Wormwood, I sometimes wonder whether or not you think you have been sent into the world for your own amusement. I gather, not from your own miserably inadequate report, but from that of the Infernal Police, that your patient's behavior during his first protest is the worst possible. He has been very frightened and thinks himself a great coward and therefore feels no pride, but he has done everything that duty demanded of him and more. Against this disaster, all you can produce on the credit side is some ill temper against a dog that tripped him up, maybe some excessive smoking and forgetting a single prayer. What is the use of whining to me about your difficulties? If you're proceeding on the enemy's idea of justice and think that your opportunities and intentions should be taken into account, then I don't wonder whether or not a charge of heresy lies against you. At any rate, you will soon find that the justice of hell is purely realistic and based only on results. Bring us back food, or be food, yourself. The only constructive tweet is where you say that you still expect some good results from the patient's fatigue. That is well enough, but it won't fall into your hands. Fatigue can produce a gentleness and quietness of mind, even something like vision. If you have seen people led by it often into malice, rage, and impatience, well, that is because those people have efficient tempters. The paradoxical thing is that moderate fatigue is better soil for complaint than absolute exhaustion. This depends partly on physical causes, but partly on something else. It is not simply fatigue as such which produces the anger in a human, but rather unexpected demands placed on a human already tired. You see, whatever humans come to expect, they eventually start to think that they have a right to, and we can twist that disappointment into a sense of injury. It is after someone is given into the irredeemable, after they have despaired of relief and ceased to think even a half hour ahead, that the dangers of humbled and gentle weariness begin. Therefore, to make the best of your patient's fatigue, you must feed him false hopes. Keep giving him plausible reasons why the conflict might not be repeated. Keep him consoling himself with how much he will enjoy his bed next night. Exaggerate the weariness by making him think that it will soon be over, for humans usually feel that a strain could be born no longer at the very moment when it is ending, or when they think it is ending. In this, as in the problem of cowardice, the main thing is to avoid the total commitment. Whatever he says, let his inner resolution be not to endure whatever comes to him, but to endure it for a reasonable period of time, and then let that period of time be just shorter than the trial is likely to be last. It need not be much shorter, for the main fun in attacks on chastity, fortitude, and patience is to let the patient yield right before relief was coming. I do not know whether he is likely to meet the girl under conditions of strain or not. If he does, make full use of the fact that, up to a certain point, fatigue makes women talk more and men talk less. Much secret resentment, even between lovers, can be raised from this. Probably the scenes which he is now witnessing will not provide any material for an intellectual attack on his faith. Your previous failures have put that out of your power. However, there is an emotional attack which can still be tried. It turns on having him feel, when he first sees human brains splattered against a wall, that this is what the world is really like, and that all his religion has been a mere fantasy. You will notice that we've got them completely fogged about the meaning of the word real. They will tell each other of some great spiritual experience. All that really happened is that you heard some music in a nice building. Here the word real is being used to mean the bare physical facts with all other parts of the experience that they had completely separated. On the other hand, they might say something like, Oh, it's all very well and good to discuss that high dive from here in your armchairs, but wait till you get up there and see what it is really like. Here, real is being used in the opposite sense, not to mean the bare physical facts, which they know perfectly well from sitting in their armchairs, but rather the emotional experience that those facts will have on a human psyche. Either use of the word could be defended. Our business is to keep them using both at once, so that the emotional value of the word real can be used first on one side of the account and then the other, as it happens to suit us. Right now, the general rule we have them operating under is that for anything that can make them happier or better, then only the physical facts are real and all the spiritual parts are subjective. On the other hand, for anything that can discourage or corrupt them, only the spiritual parts are real, and to ignore them would be to be escapist. Thus, in birth, the blood and pain are real, the rejoicing is merely a subjective point of view, whereas in death, the terror and ugliness are the real aspects, and they show what death is really like. The hatefulness of a hated person is what's real, and you are feeling disillusioned by them. But on the other hand, the loveliness of a loved person is not real. What's really real is your sexual appetite. Wars and poverty are really horrible, but peace and plenty are mere physical facts about which people have certain sentiments. The humans are always uh, accusing each other of wanting to have their cake and eat it too. But, thanks to our efforts, they are often paying for the cake and not eating it at all. Your patient, properly handled, will have no difficulty in regarding his emotion at the sight of human brains as a revelation of reality, while his emotion at the sight of happy children or fair weather is mere sentiment.